Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Good. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, I'm glad to see some visitors and our uh, regular members. And hello to the people that are watching on the uh, internet this morning. And I just saw in our bulletin something new, um, a visitor, visitor registration slip. So if you're a visitor, please fill this out because we'd love to know more, a little bit more about you. And I want to thank everybody for coming and have a wonderful day. And this is a brand new year and a brand new decade and a first Sabbath of our 2020 year. So welcome all. Happy New Year, everyone. I was so sick last week, I thought I was going to die. And my daughter said, let's go to the emergency room. And I said, I'd rather die. So, <laughs> so let's all stand together and sing, Be Thou My Vision. So good to see you, everyone standing. Sing it out with us. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence Second stanza. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, my true love song. Thou in me. Ladies on the third stanza. Come on, ladies, with me. Riches I heed not, nor man said be praised. Thou mine inheritest now and always. Thou and thou only be first in Everyone on the last stanza, sing it out. High King of Heaven, when victory is won, may I reach Heaven's joy, O bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my. standing for prayer. We'll start this new year by uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer. I thought that might be very appropriate for uh, today. But while you say the words that we all know, I'd like you to just dwell on the words a little bit and think about what they mean. Let's bow. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated.
At this time, let's have all of our children join us up front for our children's story. If you'd like to come down for the children's story, come on up and meet us right up here, and we're going to have a story for the kids. Hey guys, welcome. I think we may have some more kids joining us, but we'll get started with who we have. Happy Sabbath, guys. Happy, happy Thank you for saying happy Sabbath. Um, so my name is Dan, and my son Palmer asked me if he could help with children's story today. So I'm going to ask him a couple questions, okay? Hey Palmer, how long have you been going to this church? I, I was not telling you. Okay, that's fine. But here, here is how long Palmer has been going to our church. He's been going to our church his whole life. That's, that's like three and a half years. That's a long time. But more than that, uh, I, I'm his dad, and I've been going to this church my whole life, too. Uh, nearly my whole life. And then before I went to this church, my parents went to this church, too, many years ago. But even before that, a group of people got together here in Worthington in the year 1920 and signed our charter to make us a church, a Seventh-day Adventist church here in Worthington, Ohio. You okay, John? Okay. Um, and that, that was a long time ago. Was anybody here in 1920? Anybody here today? No, nope, not anyone was here in 1920, 100 years ago. That means that this year is our church's centennial. Our church has been in an, an incorporated church in the Ohio Conference for... 100 years this year and we're gonna have a big celebration about that and so 1920 was the year that we started and 2020 is a hundred years later and the number 2020 can mean something interesting it's also a way to think about or it's something that you hear when you go to the eye doctor and you talk about your vision and how good your vision is and with 2020 vision you can see pretty well and so we want this year for our church in this new year to have God's vision for us. And there are a lot of things in the Bible that can tell us about what's God, what God's vision might be for us in the coming year. But I've got a verse that I like that I, I think really, to me, talks about what I think God's vision might be for us. So I'm going to share that verse with you guys this morning for Children's Story. And this is from John chapter 14. This is the first verse and, and the second and third verse, I think, of John chapter 14. Do not... That's for me. Thank you, son. Um, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you can be also. So God's vision for us is to be where he is. So this year in 2020, our vision for our church is to try to find ways that we can reach out to others around us and help them understand God's love for them, okay? And I want us to all think about this year as we enter uh, this special year for our church, the year 2020. At this time, we're going to have a quick word of prayer, and then I'll have you guys come up and we can go pick up an offering, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this church and for all of the mommies and daddies who came before us to help us build this legacy in Worthington for a hundred years. I pray that you would help us have your vision for what you would have us do, Lord. And we thank you so much that your vision included saving us and having a plan to take us home to live with you forever and ever. So until you come to take us home, which we pray will be very, very soon, help us to be your hands and feet here in the community to touch others and tell them the good news about Jesus. Amen. Come on up here, guys. We'll get some buckets here. We'll
happy Sabbath. And happy New Year. I, I trust every, well, all of the survivors of Christmas are here, I see. Those that didn't survive obviously didn't show up. And, uh, and uh, how many of you made your New Year's resolutions? Only one? Two. Okay, have you kept your resolution so far? Yeah? How, how about you? Well, that, wow, that's three days old. That's great. That's more than most people make their resolution. Yeah. Uh, I have made a, revel, a re resolution, uh, something that I have resolved to do. You know, we, we celebrate Christmas uh, traditionally to celebrate uh, Christ's birth in December. Uh, probably not when he was born. Uh, but uh, we still remember to, to celebrate the fact that God kept his promise to send a Savior into the world. And my resolution is to remember that. The fact that Christ fulfilled the promises of old, the promises given to Adam and Eve way back in the Garden of Eden and on down through the ages. And so to keep that precious gift that was given to us in my heart, uh, that, that's my New Year's resolution. And I, I pray that it's yours as well. And that's the reason that I'm going to sing this song. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh hear the angel voices, oh now was born, O oh, night divine, O oh, night, O oh, night Faith serenely beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand. So led by light of a star sweetly gleaming, there came the wise men from Orient land. The King of kings lay thus in lowly manger in all our trials, born to be our friend. He knows our need to our weakness as no stranger behold your king before him lowly bed behold your
love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name. Shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ Christ is the Lord then because uh, I changed keys on him this morning. <laughs> and so he did a wonderful job. So he, uh, you know, the Lord's truly blessed him. Have you prepared yourself for a year of vision jokes? Are you ready for that yet? Okay, good, because we're already here. All right, 2020, uh, you noticed, of course, that I'm back. This is my first week fully back in the saddle after maternity leave. You noticed, of course, that I am particularly well-rested. And uh, that's usually what maternity leave will do for you. So here I am, back in the flesh, ready to go. And it is good to see your smiling faces. You know, it's been fun to be a church member. I got to float around and visit some different Sabbath school classes. You guys are fun. Did you know that? Yeah, you're kind of funny, too. And so it's, it's just a joy both to, um, to worship with you and also to work for you as well. Got a story this morning. Today I'm going to talk about my babies, too. I hope that's all right. If it's not, oh well, because I got the mic. The <laughs> name of the sermon today is going to be By the Hand. We're going to my favorite book today. I just can't help myself. The book of Mark, a tiny sliver of a story here as well. Uh, but before we do that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into what the Lord has for us this morning. Jesus, thank you so much for this day, for the holiday season, for the new year, the new start. We ask that our worship would be acceptable and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, all God's children said together, Amen. Amen. A lot of the lessons learned in this business are written in blood. If we don't learn from them, the people who died died in vain. That's what one veteran astronaut said in regards to this tragedy. January 28, 1986, a mere 73 seconds after liftoff and the name of the space shuttle was the Challenger. You might remember, of course, that seven astronauts died on that day. And of particular interest, a high school teacher who was attempting to be the very first of NASA's teachers in space also passed away on that day too. The problem was a design flaw complicated by the weather situation which was unrecognized at the time by the appropriate managers. Wayne Hale, the space shuttle program manager said, we wished we had the foresight that day to say, it's just too cold a day to launch, we should wait for a warmer one. In retrospect, it seems so simple at the time it just 
didn't happen. Perhaps you've heard some of those heart-wrenching recordings that we have of the astronauts talking to each other prior to, during, and then after the liftoff. You can hear them calling out to their friends, those that were spaced kind of far in the back, saying, hey man, are you back there? And then discovering that some of them had already passed away. You can hear them saying things like, it's getting really hot in here. And then one of the last things you hear come over the intercom is the sound of a woman panicking. Maybe it was the high school teacher. Maybe she didn't really realize what could happen. But as she did, maybe it was her that started to panic. And one of the very last things that you can hear over the intercom is the voice of a man saying to that woman, Here, give me your hand. As they were plummeting over 200 miles an hour towards the Atlantic Ocean, headed for ultimate death, he offered to her the very last bit of comfort that he possessed to go into it hand in hand. Well, today we're going to read a story about another guy who was led by the hand. And I want to invite, if I can get uh, Rafi to come up here and grab this mic, I need one volunteer to read for us here. I love hearing you read from the audience. And I will say this, that five years in the classroom has taught me I interrupt way too much. I would always ask my students to read the story, and then I'd get so excited I'd interrupt them. I'm trying to work on that. My students would just get exasperated and say, oh, just read it yourself. But today... It's a new year. Let's let someone else read. Mark 8, 22 through 26. This is taken from the English Standard Version. Who would be brave enough the very first weekend of the year to read this little story for us? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Vicki, here it comes. Yeah, exactly. I did make it easy. It's also a vision test, if you can read it. We'll know. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly, and he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mark chapter 8, and consequently Mark chapter 7, Jesus is talking about vision problems, vision problems, vision problems, vision problems. Not necessarily physical vision problems, but the problems that the disciples had with seeing what was right in front of them, God. And the problems that the Pharisees had with not seeing what was right in front of them, God. And then Mark tucks in a little sliver of a story about a guy who actually has a physical sight Problem. But the whole thing is all about sight. One of my favorite, actually my favorite Greek verb is found in this story too. It's really fun. Try it out. Blepo. Blepo. It's just kind of fun, right? You can actually take that home and just incorporate it right into your vocabulary today because it means I see. That's the infinitive form of that verb, to see. So, blepo, I see. See, that's what the story is going to be all about today. Now, we need to take this story out and run it through our spiritual calendar and sift out the really important facts. And the very first one is that Mark tells us where they are, Bethsaida. Well, that might not mean too much to you at this point in time, but I'm going to help make it mean something to you today. Bethsaida wasn't necessarily on Jesus' way to where he was going, but with his divine wisdom, discernment, and acuity, Jesus looks ahead and notices that somebody's going to want to meet up with him. So he chooses to walk right through Bethsaida. Bethsaida is not known for being a good place. Bethsaida is later called out by Jesus as being a major disbelieving town. Jesus is not proud of Bethsaida, but he chooses to go there anyway. We also find a few other phrases that help us to understand Bethsaida is not ranking real high in the list of favorites because Mark tells us that when Jesus wants to heal somebody, he takes him out of the village. And then he says, don't even go back into the village. So Bethsaida may not necessarily be the best place to be. 
Next, some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch them. Now, this story is set up very similarly to another healing story right above this in the book of Mark, where some people bring somebody to be healed by Jesus. And you might be tempted to think, well, isn't that nice? They must surely be friends. They really care about him. And that's possible. But what is also possible, perhaps even more probable, is the fact that those people previously looked down on this man. Blind people were seen as being judged by God. They couldn't enter into the temple. They were seen as being the bad guy, the result of some kind of sin. So what's more likely is that these people had paid no attention and they didn't care about the blind man until Jesus comes through town and now we want to see a miracle. Go get the blind guy and bring him over here. Some people, some people, do you have some people like that in your life? Jesus was there, the disciples were there, some people were there. And blind guy is also there as well. With his divine acuity, his divine vision, Jesus looks at the situation, he sees what's coming at him, and he realizes that it would not be advantageous to heal this man in his present circumstance. So here's what he does. He takes that blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. Now, if you're comfortable marking in your Bible, this is a phrase that you should definitely mark. Highlight, circle, color in. Jesus did it by the hand. What an intimate phrase that gives us this idea that Jesus could have just said, well, hurry up, follow me. We're going to go through a little obstacle course. But instead, what Jesus does is he actually takes this man's hand and together they walk. And I want to venture a guess that blind guy never forgot that walk. I want to venture a guess that that walk with Jesus was the highlight of his life life by the hand that little phrase tips us off to a secret that jesus does not want encounters with his children he wants a long-term relationship you should write that down jesus does not want simply encounters with his children he wants a long-term relationship. And so together, they go on that walk. Just he and Jesus, hand in hand. And maybe some people said to him, Blind guy, where are you going? I don't know, but I'm going with Jesus. And maybe some people said, Hey, blind guy, how long is it going to take you to get there? I don't know. I'm just going with Jesus. Blind guy, you're still in the dark. Yeah, but now I'm walking right beside the light. Jesus takes this man a safe distance outside of the village. He realizes it wouldn't be advantageous to leave him there. This man is going to have to make some kind of an effort to move his body to get to a position where Christ can really get through to him. And he's willing to make the effort, unlike some of us. Challenging to help an alcoholic in the middle of a bar. It's challenging to perform CPR in the middle of the ocean. You've got to get to a place where you can connect and get through. So Jesus takes blind guy on a walk. And then he does this peculiar thing. He, he spits on his eyes and he lays his hands on him. And we get this idea that Jesus is maybe making a little poultice out of clay that's on the dirt. Because he's, he's spitting and it's just kind of weird. But kind of cool at the same time and so typical of God always coming down to play in our dirt the first time to create us and the second time to save us. 
He spit on him, and he lays his hands on him, and then he asks him a question. He says, do you see anything? Does Jesus know the answer to the question, yes or no? Jesus does know the answer to the question. But Jesus, the master teacher, wants blind guy to do some self-reflection. Jesus wants blind guy to do some self-evaluation because he knows that that's when growth happens. So blind guy now has the opportunity to say, where have I been? Where am I now? And where am I going? Now it's 2020. We've turned the page. Apparently a lot of you didn't make resolutions. Now is the time to start. One thing that you ought to do every year, maybe you boycott the new year, I don't know. Choose a time in the year, any time will do. And do a little self-reflection, a self-evaluation of how your spiritual life is going. Where were you before Jesus? Where are you now with Jesus? Where are you going with Jesus? The thing about those reflections and evaluations is that sometimes they can be very painful. But look at how productive they can be. If you really want to live in Christ, you're going to grow in Christ. If you're not growing, you're not living, which means you're dying. I'm not saying that you need to be the most patient person in the world, but what I am saying is that you should be more patient than you were last year. You should be more kind than you were last year. You should be more loving than you were last year. You should have more tools to deal with depression and anxiety than you did last year. More discernment in dealing with the elderly because growth is growth no matter the speed. Forward is forward no matter the speed. And that's what all of God's children should strive to have in their lives. Blind guy, do you see anything? And there's several admirable things about blind guy. First of all, he's willing to put in the effort to move his hindquarters from one area to another as long as he's going with Jesus. Secondly, he has faith in Jesus and he still can't see. Third, he's painfully honest. It's a good thing to be honest. Jesus already knows the answer to his question. I don't know why we try and lie to him, but we do it all the time. Jesus says, do you see anything? And blind guy is like, well, I feel like this is God, so I probably should answer correctly. And I'm going to be honest with you. I see people, but they look like trees walking around. If your reflection is not honest, it is pointless. I see people, but they look like trees, and they are walking around. In other words, what he recognizes is that it's not perfect, but he sees progress. When you do your self-reflection and your self-evaluation, do not expect yourself to be perfect. God does not expect you to be perfect, but he does expect for there to be progress. There's a process. But nobody wants to go through the process, right? They just want the final product. Epidurals, one of the world's finest inventions. Amen? (laughs) Nobody wants to wait to get them. You want them when you want them. For those of you who didn't experience or have the privilege of receiving an epidural on behalf of Eve, I just want to say I am so sorry. You really missed out. They're great. You know, you're there and you're laboring. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this story later, but just three short months ago, there I was and I was laboring and we had a little hold up. You know, are we just going to try and tough it out and, and push? Are we going to do a C-section? We don't know. So we don't know what we're going to give her. So we're just going to wait. And, and uh, you know, this may have actually happened in a relatively short amount of time, but I'm telling the story today. Okay. And for a laboring woman, every minute is an hour. Am I right or am I right? So it was hours, people. And and we were waiting and I was listening to this back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And, you know, it's always very interesting to me that um, when you, if you're going to have a C-section, they want to take you into a sterile environment. Which means they have to take your husband away from you, ladies. Which is really interesting because at that moment, the only thing you wish to be sterile is actually your... (laughs) 
so I'm sitting there by myself and I'm laboring with my husband's child and he is gone. And we're still trying to decide if we're going to do the epidural and the sweet little nurse named Allison gets up in my face. Brooke, we're going to do the epidural now. I need you to sit up, but that's going to make it hurt worse. Oh, great. By all means, let's get gravity on board. Gravity, never been your friend before. And so there you are. I know you can picture this in your mind's eye, ladies. You're like a beached whale. You can't even get up by yourself. And we've decided I've got the hope of the epidural right in front of me. We just have to sit up. And so these nurses helped me sit up and swing my legs over the edge of the bed. And I can feel it coming. I know there's going to be another contraction. It's just right around the corner. I'm thinking, let's just get this epidural going. Let's do it. Nothing happened. The nurse was not wrong. It did hurt worse to sit up. And I waited. Remember, I'm telling the story for hours. There on the edge of the bed, and I'm waiting, and I'm thinking to myself, Bob Bradley would have never made me wait like this. I just couldn't take it anymore. That girl kept getting right up in my face, and I... This took a moment to evaluate. Look deep into my heart. Was Jesus still living in there? He was not going to like what I was about to say. <laughs> she kept getting in my face, and so I got in hers. I looked back. I saw the anesthesiologist. She was moving like a sloth. <laughs> You could see green mold growing on her skin. And I'm sitting there heaving. And finally, I looked at that nurse and said, What are we waiting for? No one likes the process. We all want the product. No one has the patience that it takes to wait. But we got to give it to him. Because blind guy does. Blind guy could have chosen to end this story differently. When Jesus says, let's go for a walk, he could have said, no. I walked all this way to see you here. I'm not going to walk any further. First time Jesus touches him, he doesn't get exactly what he wants. I am not going any further with you. You have run out of healing power for today. Would you charge yourself up and return tomorrow? Blind guy hangs in there for the process because he's walking with Jesus who's taking him by the hand. Would you relax and give God time to work? Would you just relax and stop looking at your watch for one minute? Do you know how much anxiety we give ourselves because God does not act in the manner which we have told him to do so? Would you give God time to work? I want you to notice this, that when Jesus hears that the man cannot see clearly... The Bible tells us that he lays his hands on his eyes. Say that word with me again. And he opened his eyes. There's that word, blepo, right there. His sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. I don't know if you know this or not, church, but Jesus does not do second class work. Jesus does not leave. Jesus does not give up. Jesus does not give in. Jesus finishes what he starts. He's got this little thing where when he begins a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it. Would you just relax and give God time to work? This is a significant miracle in the Bible because it is the only one in which Jesus used a process to heal someone. 
Jesus used a process in order to heal someone. There were other miracles where there were processes involved, like Naaman, for example. But this one is kind of special because this is the one that Jesus used. He could have done it instantaneously with a touch from far away, from calling out, having the disciples go and do it for him or whatever. But Jesus shows us here that he is interested in more than just the encounter. Jesus is interested in relationship with his people. And Jesus wants us to find the joy in the journey. When he's leading us by the hand. I told you I was going to talk about my babies today. And I don't want to disappoint you. I also dug up some pictures I thought you would find to be interesting. Especially since how my husband's down at the youth rally today. I can show you whatever pictures I want. <laughs> when I was 16 years old. That was a very pivotal time in my life. I became very sick and had to drop out of school for a whole semester. My mom worked tirelessly to help get to the bottom of what was causing this massive health breakdown that I was having. And, and it was really something. I, there's so many miracles with it. I just sometime I want to tell you my whole testimony. But for the sake of time today, I just want to tell you this part that I was very, very sick. And when we finally kind of got to what we believed to be the bottom of it, I was diagnosed with a condition that could cause infertility. And that doesn't really mean much when you're 16, does it? You don't want to think about the fact that you have a uterus, you certainly don't want anybody else to think about. That, that just doesn't mean anything. But of course, at 16, there was nothing much to do about it to find out if that was true or not. It was just an opportunity to take Jesus' hand and see what was going to happen in the future. I didn't understand what it would mean to struggle with infertility, but my mom, of course, did, and she tried. I could tell that it was a heavy burden on her that she tried to convey to me. It was during that time, though, folks, that I fell in love with Jesus. I wouldn't change that time in life. It was wicked painful, and it hurt physically, spiritually, emotionally. But I met Jesus, and I also fell in love with this book. There's a story in Mark chapter 5 about this woman who has an issue of blood, and she just reaches out, and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment because she believes, and she knows that Jesus is the only one who can fix her. And I believed that to be true myself. I resonated with that text. And another text that I fell in love with comes to us from the book of Psalm. And, and there's this little verse that says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. Or in this case, the Lord heard her, and wait for it, and delivered her from all her fears. And I love that text then, and I love that text now, because it doesn't say the Lord delivered her from her circumstance. The Lord delivered him from his situation. What the Lord did was even greater. He delivered him from the fear of his situation. And that's the worst part. I resonated with that, and I also read a little story about Hannah and Samuel. You read that story? And I didn't really understand much, but I thought, hey, I can identify with this lady. And so I remember at the ripe old age of 16, praying and saying, Lord, if you give me a son, I would like to give him back to you. A couple years later, baby Brooke and baby Jeremy started dating. And on one of our dates, we had received a gift certificate to build a bear. So we went there and we built a son. And uh, as we made our little bear, which is today at home, in our son's room, I said, I want to have a son one day, and I'd like to call him Samuel James. And Pastor Jeremy said, okay. And we didn't really think too much about it at the time. But life went on. Baby Brooke and baby Jeremy got married. And we prayed there in 2012 at our wedding that if we had any spiritual gifts, any spiritual talents, we just prayed that they would be doubled in the lives of our children. And I want to tell you about some other important parts of my life because this will make sense to you here. This is a picture of my dad and my grandpa. 
They are as different as two men can be. My dad is very quiet and reserved. My grandpa was very loud and outgoing. Together, they just made the perfect person. They worked together for over 25 years doing drywall. They were basically one, one person working together, two halves put together to make a whole. My grandpa was very involved in my life, one of my absolute favorite people. And of course, my dad was uh, and continues to be as well. Well, in 2015, we found out that we were pregnant. And so we went home in October and we shared that news with the family. And just a few short months later, on December 25th of 2015, my grandpa passed away. And it was so sad, so sad. And we, of course, wanted him to be able to meet our daughter, but we realized he wouldn't be able to do that, so we wanted to do a little something with the name. We couldn't name the girl James. We knew that. Um, And we couldn't name her Jamie because that was the family dog's name. And uh, that just was not wise. And so I said, let's do as much with J as we can. And so consequently, J, J. And we picked the names to match that, Janae Joy. So on April 11, 2016, little baby JJ was born, and that girl brought more joy into our lives than we thought we could even know. Do you remember that, parents, when your children were born? We can't even remember life, what it was like before then, probably because of the lack of sleep. It must have been nice back then, but we don't even remember that now because it's all about the babies. That girl brought us so much joy. And, And then in 2019, of course, you remember because you were here and we shared it with you that we were expecting another child. And as soon as I found out that I was pregnant, I started to do the math. And what do you know? Our due date was going to be October 12th. My grandpa's birthday was October 6th. You know, birthdays are really hard when someone passes away. They should be happy, a good celebration of life. But they're just kind of sad, aren't they? And I really wanted, especially for the sake of my dad, to make that day happy again. And so I prayed, and I enlisted the prayers of many of you, shamelessly, to pray that October 6th would be the day that our son would be born. That child had been named for over 10 years. We just had to wait for him. And boy, you know, those closing weeks, they get hard, don't they? And you're just thinking, I don't even care how, just get this kid out, just get him out. It was hard to wait. And there were a couple times I thought, you know, maybe if I just go in and I just tell my sad story, I just start to cry. I'll just tell them my water broke and maybe they'll just keep me. (laughs) But then I thought, no, because if they send me home, I'm not going to be happy. So I decided I was going to wait. I wasn't going to manipulate it as much as I wanted to do that. So I went to bed. My mom came up. My dad came up. They were like, this kid's going to be born on October 6th. And I was like, okay, we're going to try not to rush it. But yes, we hope so. (laughs) October 6th. And my mom is a massage therapist. And so she was doing all these pressure points. And it hurt like the dickens. But I was like, I don't even care. Just speed it up. Just bring it on. Let's let's get this party started. And so I was laying in bed on October 6th at 5 a.m. in the morning. And I woke up and I thought to myself, that is a lot of pressure. And then at 5.30, the contraction started. But it was too good to be true because it was October 6th. That's the day that we were going for, right? And again, I was not about to go in the hospital and be sent home. So I had to stay home and make sure that it was the real deal. So by the time we finally did that, uh, we loaded up in the car. Pastor Jeremy took us on a little detour, which you heard about. Out, but we finally arrived and we got to Riverside Hospital and it was 6.30 in the morning. We realized that we were definitely going to have a baby that day and it was uh, fortunate enough to be right at the shift change. That's a fun time to go to the hospital, isn't it? Okay. People kept coming in. Hello, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do this for you. And then they would leave. And then someone else would come in right? And you're just laboring, just laboring, just thinking, let's just get this going. And we, we kind of came to a, a stall there for a little bit because things were moving so rapidly with this blessed child that some of the nurses in the room said she should just push. Look at how close she is. But then some of the other nurses said, but the patient was supposed to have a C-section. 
Uh, Mrs. Wong, do you want to push or do you want to have a C-section? I'm going to be real honest with you. That's not really the time in life to be making big decisions. You know, and then they take your husband away and you're just thinking like, what? I do remember at one point they actually brought in a piece of paper and asked me to sign for something. No idea what I signed. None. Okay. So should she push? Should she have the C-section? Look at how fast this is going. Well, there was no doctor yet. Everybody wanted to go home, so did I. Nevertheless, they finally decided, let's take her back to the OR and get her ready just in case. But even when we got back there, my little nurse, Allison, Brooke, I think you can push. I don't think you need an epidural. It'll be so close, so fast. And I'm not an expert, okay? I don't have a medical degree. But I do have an MOM degree. I do have an MOM degree, and, and I do recall a very specific moment in which I felt like we were progressing. I don't want to say nicely, because you don't progress nicely when you're laboring, but progressing. And then I just felt like there was a sudden change in things, like that I couldn't explain, not an expert. But it just started to make me think, I don't think that this is right. I don't think everything is going to be okay with this. And I did consider just trying to push because they said it was going to be quick. But I thought, this does not feel quite right to me. So at the last minute, the doctor comes in. Together, we make the decision. We're just going to do a C-section. Praise God that we did. Because that first slice, and here's what had happened, a uterine rupture. And that baby was coming shoulder first right out now of course you know the guys they get to do all the fun stuff they take the baby away dad follows along on cloud nine mother <laughs> stuck there on the table but I remember the doctor said to me you know you're really lucky this didn't happen to you at home you're really lucky this didn't happen to you on the way here this would have been a very different story. You're lucky that you didn't push. But you know the thing about luck? Four-letter word. Christians don't believe in that, do we? And so I wish that I, you know, could come forth with some kind of a, ah, but all I could just say was, praise God. Praise God. That's how our little miracle Samuel James Durst Wong was born. What a miracle. What a blessing. And that's something we're going to remember for the rest of our lives. I don't know what taking Jesus by the hand is going to look like in your life. But I do know what it has looked like in mine to this point. And not every chapter has been beautiful. And not every chapter has been easy. Not every chapter has been fun. But I have definitely found the joy in the journey, just walking hand in hand with Jesus. When I started way back, when I was 16 years old, I didn't know how the story was going to end. I didn't know what it was going to be like, but I knew who I was walking with. And that's what made all the difference in the world. I don't know what your experience is going to be like, but I do know that Jesus would like to take your hand today. So I want to ask you this question now, and I want you to think really, really hard. Going back to Mark chapter 8 now, where we have this process. Blind man can't see, then he can partially see, then he can fully see. There were three stages in that miracle. What stage was the miracle? If you had to identify at one point what the miracle was, what, where would you say it is? Was the miracle when he received partial sight? Or was the miracle when he received his full sight and could see everything clearly? I want to suggest to you that neither of those things were the real miracle. Here's what the real miracle was. Get ready for this. The real miracle is that blind guy took Jesus' hand because at the moment that he did, he still couldn't see. Blind guy took Jesus' hand 
without ever seeing Jesus' agenda. There was no itinerary that was sent to him. There was no five-step plan that was submitted. Just the hand of divinity extended and the hand of humanity accepting. By the hand. That's how Jesus took that man. And when his expectations were not met, he didn't turn back. The real miracle had nothing to do with vision, in my opinion, and everything to do with the fact that he still couldn't see when he took Jesus' hand. Sing with me. Maybe blind guy was the first one to pen these words. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Jesus might not always do what we expect, but he will always do for us what we need. How many times we have gathered around the bedside of a person who has cancer and we have prayed and we have prayed and we have begged and pleaded that the cancer would be removed, but it isn't. Sometimes God allows that cancer to happen to bring us to a situation where we can actually meet Christ. The guy with AIDS might think that AIDS is the problem, but maybe when Jesus looks at him with his divine acuity, his divine eyesight, he says, that's not the problem. The problem is your anger. Let's work on that together. The fibromyalgia patient might say, oh, this hurts. This pain is the problem. But really, maybe what the real problem is, is fear. And Jesus wants to work us through that. Maybe depression isn't the only issue we have. Maybe the issue is that we need to learn to ask God to meet our deepest needs. God does not always do what we expect, but he always gives us what we need. I'm looking forward to that time when there will be no disease. Can't wait till heaven when we can see Jesus clearly face to face what a joy that will be. A lot of us right now can only see partially. A lot of us right now are still in phase one of the healing. And it's not fun. And you see trees and they look, uh, you see men and they look like trees and they're walking around and it's not clear to you and you don't know what the next chapter looks like. And, and you just don't know. But one thing you can know is who is holding you by the hand. Here's a little passage from my favorite author. She says it like this, and it just blows my human-sized brain. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. In other words, if you could put on your God-sized glasses, you would choose for yourself the same life and the same obstacles and the same challenges because you'd be able to see what God sees. By the hand, the real miracle that the blind man still couldn't see. The question for you today is, as the hand of divinity is extended to you, are you willing to take it by the hand? Not knowing what's next, not knowing what's along the way, but knowing who holds your hand. Jesus literally extended himself for you, will you take him by the hand? By his hand he leadeth us. And with a brand new year, as uh, Dan reminded us, a hundred years in this congregation, we have the opportunity to begin not only a new year, a new decade, but a new century in the history of this congregation. 
And I can't tell you how happy I am to learn that many members of this congregation are diligent in living out the truth, exactly as commanded by the Father. But permit me a reminder, friends, that this is not a new commandment, but simply a repetition of our original and basic character, that we love each other. Love means following his commandments, and his unifying commandment is that we conduct our lives in love. This is the first thing that you heard, and nothing has changed. Now, that message didn't come from me. I brought it forward from 2,000 years ago. That was the message by John in 2 John 1, and uh, verses 4 through 6. So now's the time, as we bring the deacons forward, to remember that we live in love and to share that love with each other and to entrust our tithes and offerings to the church to share that love with everyone in our community, as local as Worthington and as large as our planet. Dear Father, take our tithes and offerings, use them to do your work, help us to give with all the love that you've given us so that it might be returned to you and blessed as were the fishes and the loaves. We put our hearts and our hands in yours and give in that spirit. In thy name we pray, amen. New Year, again. Is there anything you wish to do differently over the next 12 months? A new diet? Learn a new instrument? Read more? Let me ask you something. How many times have you failed to accomplish these new things you planned on the first day of January? You don't have to answer. Just think about it. Well, knowing that the things you do are directly related to who you are, why keep trying new things when you can actually become a new you? You know what I mean? But if you're already thinking, this is not that simple, I'll remind you of a few words. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So let me propose something to you. As the year starts, be a new creation. Be in Christ as you open your eyes each morning. Be in Christ as you have breakfast, through family worship. Be in Christ during the week, at home, at school, at work. Be in Christ as you attend church on Sabbath and commune with your brothers and sisters. Be in Christ as you return your time, recognizing everything is His. Be in Christ as you give your promise. Be grateful to your only provider. Be in Christ. Connect with Him. Let your purposes be His. Your routine start with Him. And your life be transformed through Him. In this new year, your plans can work and last. You just need to put God first. Amen. As you stand for the closing hymn, 537, I have just a short story for the chaplain. I was on OB call one of those nights there were five women in labor, and one woman, you may stand, one woman was disturbing the whole birthing center. So they called me for an epidural about two in the morning. So as I come around the corner with my epidural cart, she had kicked her husband out of the room, and he saw me, he said, who are you? I said, I'm anesthesia. He said, no, you're God. Get in the room and take the devil out of my wife. <laughs> Kudos to any woman in labor. Unless you've been there, you'll never know. Him, 537, he leadeth me. Everyone with me. Whatever I do, where 
ladies only. It seems a deepest group sometimes where Eden's flowers bloom by water still or trouble see still tis his hand that leadeth me everyone he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own hand he leadeth me his faithful follower I would be for by his hand he leadeth me men with me now Lord I would clasp my hand in thine nor ever murmur nor repine content whatever lot I see still tis my God that leadeth me everyone he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own hand he leadeth me his faithful follower I would be for by his land he leadeth me last stanza and when my task on earth is done when by the grace the victory's won he dance away I will not flee since God through Jordan leadeth me he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own and he leadeth me his faithful follower I would be for by his and he leadeth me sing that chorus with me he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own and he leadeth me his faithful follower I would be for by his hand he leadeth me. Thank you. Not as clear as when we get to heaven, that's for sure. You might not know what the next chapter is going to look like or what it looks like on the other side of that obstacle you're climbing. But I want to encourage you to hang on to Jesus' hand. That's the only way you're going to get through 2020, by his hand. Little ones, we've got some sunglasses today to remind us, since we've seen a little bit more sun than snow, to remind us that life is not always clear, but we can smile anyway. Let's pray today. In Jesus' name, we just want to ask that you would join us. Jesus, in your name, we just want to ask that you would be with us during the dark times in life. In Jesus' name, we want to ask that you would walk with us, but more importantly, give us the faith to walk with you each and every day of this new year. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's children said together, Amen.